Hi, welcome back. Um, this little video is going to be about chapter three, which is called Locating the Translations. So Jane Eyre has been translated hundreds of times into many languages. How do you find all these translations? And you might think that um, apparently global databases, so there are, there's a database called WorldCat, um, there's another one called Index Translationum, you might think that these databases have kept um, a good record, but they haven't, um, and especially not uh, for places other than Europe. Um, so for, for places that are not Europe, um, these databases are, are radically <laughs> incomplete. So what that means is you have to do a lot of work in other archives, national library catalogues, and even bookshops. Um, and many people involved in the project have kind of collaborated um, to do this, you know, what you might think to be quite straightforward research, which is just simply finding where the translations are, mm. where they've been published. Um, and actually that, that turned out to be a, a, a complicated thing to do. So once you've, you've gathered as much of that data as you can, um, you put it in a spreadsheet, at which point you, you can see something straight away. Um, so for instance, you can see that the Jane Eyre was translated into, um, into several European languages almost as soon as it was published in the UK. And one reason that's an, that's an interesting thing to, to, to see um, is that sometimes nowadays um, you hear people saying that sort of swift translation of a, of a literary book um, into several other languages um, is only a recent thing, you know, as it were, a phenomenon of, of 21st century world literature, of a globalised literary market, a new globalised literary market. Um, but in fact, the case of Jane Eyre, which is no different from the case of many other 19th century texts, and indeed some earlier texts, um, these, these instances show that, show that things are more complicated than that. There's a, there's a kind of longer history of, um, of, of swift translation um, into many languages. Something else you can easily see in the spreadsheet um, is the numbers of translations published in different countries. So for instance, on our, on our spreadsheet, you can immediately see the, the more than 100 translations that have been published um, in China. Still, beyond that, um, it's quite hard to get an in-depth understanding of the data just by, <laughs> just by looking at these. Um, now I think that it's kind of, a, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a nightmare um, document for me, this spreadsheet with lots and lots of rows, lots of columns, lots of numbers, um, which I spent a long time with. Um, so I'm hugely grateful to Giovanni Pietro Vitali, um, who's our digital humanities um, expert. He brought his expertise in digital mapping to the project. Um, and he uh, led the creation of um, several different kinds of interactive map, which we uh, used to help us um, develop our research and which are now embedded in the book um, for you to open up and explore, whether on your phone or on your screen, depending on how you're, how you're reading. Okay, let's, let's go back to the process of making these maps um, and think about that for a minute. As soon as you, you start to try to make a map, you're immediately faced with questions. And the first question is, where do you locate each translation? That's to say, where does a translation belong? What's it into? Um, and the immediate answer might be, well, a translation is into a language. Um, but the problem is it's difficult, in fact, impossible to represent um, the distribution of a language accurately on a map. You know, you can give a rough indication of where a majority of speakers are using a given language, but that area is always going to be changing and it's always going to be overlapping with other languages. I mean, if you think of pretty much any city in the world, that's going to be a multilingual environment. It's going to be unlikely there's just one language spoken in a, in a given city. And of course, people move around. So a translation um, into so Japanese might perfectly well be read, you know, not only in Japan, but in, you know, in Mexico, um, in, in Delhi or, you know, anywhere. Um, so um, one thing you discover by trying to make a map um, is, is what you cannot represent satisfactorily um, on a map, um, which, is, uh, which is interesting. Luckily, though, there are also things um, you, you, you can represent um, satisfactorily on maps. Um, and what we ended up doing was attaching every translation to the city or town where it was published. Um, and this is, of course, a traditional way of locating books. 
the place of publication um, is very often given on the title page. And what that means is that our maps show the places from which the translations have gone out into the world, um, but they don't attempt to show how, how far those translations have, have spread. There's another question. Um, having made this decision to you know, pin each translation to the city where it was published, what do we do when a translation that's first been published in one city is then published again in a different location? You know, should we should we represent that on the map or not? And I decided that the um, that we should that this needed to be shown on our maps as well. And let, let me give you an example to, um, to to show you why this is. There was a really interesting translation into Spanish by Juan de Luajes, um, first published in Barcelona under Franco's regime in 1943. Uh, but then later on, um, it traverses the Atlantic and it's published in Bogota and Buenos Aires in, in later years. So those are quite different contexts um, with quite different readers. Uh, so publishing the Barcelona translation there is, an, is, is something new. It's taking it, you know, it's, 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 it's carrying it across to a new place, making it available um, to new readers. And we decided to call this an act of translation, both the publication of a new translation and the republication of an existing translation in a new place um, those are all acts of translation. And that's what you see um, on the maps. And actually, actually, another really interesting instance of this is a translation into Russian by um, Stanevich, first published in Moscow and Leningrad, as it then was, um, in 1950, and then republished in many different locations across the Soviet Union. So on our maps, you can see this kind of vast expanse of the Soviet Union with this translation sort of popping up um, in different locations um, in different years. Um, and I'll leave that for you to um, for you to read about and explore. Mentioning the Soviet Union brings in another complicating factor, which is that the state boundaries, you know, the boundaries of countries, borders um, represented in the maps now um, are often not those that were in place when um, a given translation was published. So the maps have a kind of temporal depth to them. Um, the political organization of states that they show is, is, is kind of recent. It's from like last year or a few years ago when these map templates that we're using were created. And it's important to bear in mind that the world um, looked different um, at the moments in the past when many of the translations were published. Um, there's, there's quite a lot, I, a lot more I kind of go into in this chapter and that I could talk about. Um, so for instance, one idea about the distribution of translations is that they, they kind of spread out in waves from the place where the source text was, was first published, like a kind of emanation from the UK, which is conceived as being kind of the center in this kind of model. Um, and our research shows that that, that, that kind of idea does have um, it does have a degree of truth to it, um, but the picture is actually a lot more complicated. Um, and there are many different energies at work that collaborate to determine when and where Jane Eyre or any book is translated. And often, it's really important to see that often those energies come from the culture that wants the translation to be done. Um, so often we're not talking about translations, as it were, emanating from the UK conceived as a centre. But the center is rather the place where the translation is done. You know, the UK is over there and this, this, this culture kind of reaches out for Jane Eyre and, and, and brings, it, brings it in um, for its own purposes, you know, puts, puts, puts the novel to, um, to, to its own kind, kinds of use in its own cultural circumstances. Um, and I would kind of like to go into more detail about this, but on the other hand, it feels a bit, I feel a bit thwarted talking about a phenomenon that is much better represented visually in the book and in the interactive maps. Um, so what I want to do now actually is just sort of invite you to go and um, go into the chapter, click on the maps and explore these, um, these geographical phenomena for, for, for yourself. One, one last thing though, um, and that is how the world that Jane Eyre is translated into um, affects the world that is imagined in the novel. Um, so, so, you know, you've got 
the world that the books are translated and published in, but you've also got the fact that the book is, is itself a kind of imaginative world that the characters inhabit. As often in a Victorian novel, uh, the, the landscape that is mainly represented in the book is an English one. So Jane, in the book, Jane moves from place to place within England. But that's not the whole story. Um, for instance, in one of these English locations, Thornfield Hall, French is a very prominent language. Um, and in the chapter, I give, give some reasons um, what, what, why that is. And then beyond the locations where Jane dwells, there are places that other characters come from or go to, um, or simply that are, um, that are mentioned. And these include, for instance, the West Indies, India, um, and two locations to which Jane is connected by a strange echo of her surname. So one is Madeira, which has got the, the surname Ear in it, Mad Era. Um, and the other is the mountain range of the Andes, where um, a condor, the kind of bird called a condor, um, is at one point said to have an eerie, which again is um, something that has, you know, Jane's surname um, within it. Uh, so in the novel that Bronte wrote, there is something eerie and something complicated about the, the layering of national and world geographies. And what we see in the translations is that the coordinates of that relationship uh, shift. So what it is for the Andes to be mentioned in a translation that is being published in Chile, for instance, um, is different, you know, it works differently um, from when the Andes are mentioned in the English text published, uh, published in the UK. So the world of Jane Eyre, the world of Jane Eyre, looks different when it's rewritten in different parts of the world. Okay, so that's enough. Um, that's enough about chapter three. And in the next of my little videos, which will be the last one from me, I will uh, tell you something about chapters four, five, six, seven, and eight. Thanks. Thank you.